John 15, verses 12 through 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I have commanded you so that you will love one another. This is the word of the Lord. we're going through trial or we've experienced triumph nothing can minister to us like the word of god it's not about motivational speeches it's not about big characters with big charismatic personalities it comes down to do i believe that god's word is immutable just like him that it never changes that it's the same yesterday, today, and forever, and it was given to me by God so that I might have his self-disclosure, who he is, who his son is, who his spirit is, and walk in God. And so today, we're going to focus in on something that uh, is really a follow-up from the very beginning of the year. The first message I preached in this new year, I did an exposition from John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. Uh, that is where Jesus taught his disciples about abiding in him. And how we, when we abide in Christ, we will bear fruit. And if we're abiding and we're bearing fruit, then the Father, the vine dresser, comes and he prunes back the branches, you and I. Why? I'm already bearing fruit so that we will bear more fruit. I guess the point of abiding in Christ is that God really wants us to abide and then bear fruit to make a difference in this world. Now, it's interesting to me that you would get more fruit from a branch if you prune it than if you don't. And you say, well, what does that pruning look like in our lives? It looks like broken relationships. It looks like when I have ought with my brother and I don't do anything about it and I suffer for it. It looks like a trial that comes into my life when I think everything is going well and I don't deserve this. God is the one who orders up situations and opportunities for us to grow and mature. And in those things, when we obey him and we mature, we bear more fruit. If we choose not to obey God and follow what he's teaching us in those moments of trial, then we don't bear much fruit. It's possible to not bear any fruit. It's possible that maybe we've been bearing fruit out of our own strength for just a season of time, and then all of a sudden, we stop bearing altogether. It may be because we were never really attached to the vine. Maybe we were, we were religious, 
but we weren't saved. There's so much in verses 1 through 11. But I want to say to you that God prunes us so that we'll bear more fruit. And in bearing fruit, we're going to be loving people more. You don't, you don't bear fruit for God and love people less. You love them more. And interestingly, you and I were designed by God to love people. We were, there's a part in each one of us that is only going to be fed and, and fulfilled in relationship with others. When God created Adam and Eve, when he first made Adam, Adam had relationship with God. That was in place, and that really is what the first 11 verses are about, our relationship with God by abiding in him. But that still wasn't enough. God saw that Adam was alone, and God did not create man for aloneness. He did not create man to be by himself. He created woman to come alongside, that there would be a partnership, there would be a fellowship, and that fellowship extends beyond the husband-wife relationship. It goes into the body of Christ where these are my brothers and sisters, and God's created me to have fellowship with them. That's important to God. So I get the part about having relationship with God, but Pastor Greg, I'm really hanging up on this having to have relationship with others. Because when I do that, I get wounded. And so I'd rather just have the Father and have the Son and the Spirit and leave the rest alone. Well, that would be wonderful if God was on that page with you, but he's not. And we're going to see today in verses 12 through 17 just exactly how God views relationships with others. And it's interesting how he approaches relationships with others for us. And, and, but again, let me just go back. We were not designed for aloneness. Yet many Christians today say they love God, but they don't love his church. They're not part of his church. Some will say, oh, no, yeah, I believe in the church. We have church in our home. We have a few close friends that come over. Where's the accountability in that? Where's the submissiveness to leadership in that? If you're all just gathering and having a, a kumbaya experience, but there is no structure for you to grow and be held accountable and be supported, that's not true church. Because the entire epistle, all the epistles, are about the elders who are called to lead the church. And the people the sheep are to follow the leadership of the church. That's part of the experience of belonging to God's church. You need it. And so this alone thing is not designed by God. That comes from somebody else. What Satan wants more than anything is for Christians to be isolated. Why? Because then he's able to pick them off. He's able to destroy them over time. Uh, there's a it's actually called a wedged tail eagle. It is the largest bird of prey in Australia. It's capable of hauling off small uh, calves, lamb. I mean, we're talking animals. It can come in, swoop in, and literally with its talons like vice grips, pick up that prey and carry it away. And and But before it does that, it's it's interesting that the the wedge-tail eagle will team up with another one. And they work in tandem. And what they do is they see a flock of sheep and they swoop down on the flock. And they, they cause the sheep to spread, to separate. And at times when they see a lead sheep that is kind of going a direction and everyone's following, they'll swoop down and with their talon or with their beak, they'll pluck out the eye so that that lead sheep is disoriented and can't lead. And they wait until they see that lamb that has now been separated from the flock, and then they swoop in and take it. That is a wonderful picture of Satan at work in the lives of believers, church people, 
separating them, isolating them, and then preying upon them. So in chapter 15, <coughs> excuse me, our Lord teaches his disciples on the importance of relationships. Now, right, if you've got a pen, I really do want you to write some things down. If you have a piece of paper, find one. Um, you, you, uh, maybe you have a little pad or something, or maybe you don't mind writing in the margins of your Bible. I do that a lot, uh, especially on a particular text that's being exegeted or expounded upon. I want to write the points so that I can go back later and I can look at that, and maybe even the Lord uses it as a devotional tool in my life. I, I, I want to go ahead and give you, if I can, the outline for chapter 15, which we already preached the first sermon, verses 1 through 11. Today's verses 12 through 17. Next week we'll finish out chapter 15. But here's the three points, or the three sections of this entire chapter. Section one, first, our relationship with God. Our relationship with God. We already covered that. That's all about abiding in him. Second, our relationship with one another. We're going to cover that today. And in the last section, verses 18 through 27, our relationship with the world. Now, today as we focus on verse 12 through 17, which is our relationship with one another, I want to read again the text in light of that, and then I want to lay the backstory of what's happening that Jesus would give this teaching to his disciples. This is what adds the depth and the richness of his words and what they mean. Okay? So if we read just again, let me read for you the text. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. Now he's speaking directly to his disciples. Keep this teaching, this text that we're reading, in context. He's not speaking to the world here. He's not speaking to all Christians primarily. He is secondarily, indirectly. But directly, right now, he's speaking to his disciples. Verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whenever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I have commanded you so that you will love one another. Now let me set the scene. This is Thursday night of Passover week. The last Passover that Jesus would attend. Okay? Okay? Jesus has already entered Jerusalem on a donkey, which fulfills the prophecy that the king came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey. It's in the Old Testament. And he is declaring by that, by that experience, he's declaring that he is Messiah. So his grand entry coming into Jerusalem. He has already... Uh, met with his disciples and walked the streets of Jerusalem and ministered to many people on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday, and now it's Thursday. The, the day, the Jewish calendar, the day begins at 6 p.m. at sundown. So this is the beginning of Thursday, okay? And after he had washed his disciples, he's in the upper room, they took the Seder meal together, the Passover meal with all the Jews uh, as they would do, and then he institutes a new covenant in his blood. He gives them what we now have as the Lord's Supper after the Seder meal. Why? Because the Seder meal was about the Passover back in Egypt when the death angel passed over the homes of the Jews who had taken the unblemished lamb of their flock, treated it like a pet, brought it in, let it live in the house, and then they took and they sacrificed that lamb and put the blood on the doorpost, on the lentil. 
And the death angel, as he went through Egypt, he took out all the firstborn except for those who had the blood covering that home. That was the symbolism behind the Passover meal that the Jews celebrate even to this day. And there's other aspects of it too, the wilderness experience and all of that. But, but this would be the final time that Jesus would celebrate the Passover. Going forward, in fact, right after the meal, he institutes, I will become the once for all sacrificial lamb. I want you to take this bread. He blessed it. He gave thanks for it. He broke it. And he said, take it. This is my body given for you. Now look, they, he hasn't died yet. They still have not put two and two together, even though he's told them everything that he's going to die. But he says, take and eat. And after that, he took the cup. This is a new covenant in my blood. This cup represents. It's not my blood. Jesus did not perform transubstantiation where he turns the wine into blood. They were not literally drinking blood. It's a picture of, it's a symbol. This, blood, or this wine represents my blood. Take and drink because you're entering into a new covenant in me. No longer do you have to live by the Mosaic law and fulfill all the, all the requirements for ritual cleansing for temple sacrifice, I am becoming the once for all sacrifice. And so now they've, they've done that, and then he institutes a foot washing service. Why? Because he wants them to know that a master is not greater than his servants. It's an act of humility that our Lord provides for his disciples. And after he does that, he says, and I want you to do the same. Many, not many, some have taken that to be literal, and so they wash feet. I don't see that as literal. I see him saying, I've given you a picture of what it looks like to humble yourself and serve one another. Folks, you don't have to wait for a once-a-year foot washing service to be humble and to serve one another. Jesus said, I want you to go out and do, follow my example every day that you live. So now he's put his, himself in the proper place. He is the sacrificial lamb, worship God. And now instituting this foot washing, love one another. How? Humble yourself before your brothers and sisters. Be willing to let them win. You don't need to win. Do it for them, for their sake. Love them. Forgive them. Encourage them. Judas has already exited the room, the upper room. Jesus told him, whatever you're going to do, do quickly. And he does. He runs off and he goes straight to the religious horde that will collect the Roman soldiers and they will meet together where Judas takes them to the Garden of Gethsemane. Only he knew where Jesus would go oftentimes up by the Mount of Olives and he would pray. So Jesus now, this is chapter 13 of John. Here's the picture. I want, this is a beautiful picture. John is different from all the other Gospels. You have the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then you have John. John starts with the life of Christ, okay, and healings and all the things that Jesus did and why he did them. And then he comes to chapter 13, and from chapter 1 to chapter 12, it's like a regular moving film. You know, you're watching this film. It's awesome. Okay, good. The, Jesus, you know, he's the, he's the Messiah. And then all of a sudden, it goes into slow motion. The rest of John's gospel from 13 to chapter 17, and actually to chapter 18 and 19, because that's the crucifixion, from 13 to 19, it goes in slow motion. It only focuses on what happens in one week of the life of Jesus. His whole life, 33 years covered in the first 12 chapters, and then from 13 to 19, pff, slows down. And we see in detail. Why? Because John wants us to know how important it was 
for Christ to die, but also how important it was to have this time with his disciples. He's coming to the end. He, he will be on the cross mid-morning tomorrow. This is Thursday night. Whatever he's going to share with his disciples is really important. And from chapter 13 to 17, that's the time that they left the upper room and make their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. All those chapters dealing with this. So, John chapter 14. Turn there if you will. One back, one chapter. I want you to see what was Jesus for these four chapters, five chapters, what was he talking about? What was he telling them? What was so important that he had to take that much time to give a discourse? I'll tell you what it was. It's absolutely everything he said is saturated in love. Every one of those chapters is saturated in love. And guess, guess what? The pinnacle, the height of that love shows up in chapter 15, verse 13. So we are in the key verse or verses to all the, the whole thing regarding love. Secondly, Jesus wanted to prepare his disciples for what was going to happen when he died. He knew they would struggle. He knew that the enemy would come and tempt them to fall away because Jesus, their Savior, is now dead. He's gone. They had forgotten or not received everything he said about resurrection, and he knew it. So he gives them, for, for these chapters, he gives them promises I told you to get a pen out. I want you to just write down the verses. I'll read them, but you write them down, okay? Let me give you some of the promises covered in chapter 13 at least through 15. Just, just these three chapters, okay? John 14, he says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will, here's the promise, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. He is promising them life after death. And you know the way to where I am going. Of course, you know what happened. Thomas, the doubting disciple, said, Lord, uh, we don't know where you're going so how is it possible for us to know the way? Jesus spelled it out so clearly. Another promise. I want you to know this, Thomas. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. In John chapter 14, look at verse 15. 15 through 17. If you're writing it down. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's a funny way to get somebody to do something, commanding them to love, seriously. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, capital H, helper, to be with you forever. Another promise. I'm going to the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit to you. The Holy Spirit will be with you forever. From the second that you are regenerated by the Holy Spirit and saved to the time that you get to heaven and are in a glorified state enjoying God for all eternity. All the way through all of that, the Holy Spirit will be with you. What a promise. These men at the time are probably thinking, why do we need that? We got you. They're not hearing what he's saying. I'm leaving you. Okay? Okay. Even the spirit of truth whom the world, verse 17 there in 14, 14, 17. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I am with you right now, disciples. The word with is the Greek word para. It's a preposition. And it speaks of coming alongside. Jesus was alongside. In the physical flesh, he was alongside his disciples. He says, but I'm not going to just be alongside you. I will be, future tense, in you. The Greek word preposition is en, E-N. That means I'm going to come inside of you. 
by the Holy Spirit. Literally, right now I'm walking with you after my resurrection and the Holy Spirit comes whom I'm sending to you, he will come inside of you. The purpose of him being with you today in this world, the purpose for Jesus being with is that he might convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If he's only with you, you're not saved. He has to be in you to be saved. So to the world, he is with them in the sense that he's still working. The Holy Spirit's working to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But when they are saved, he comes in for the purpose of filling them up to the full measure of who he is and of his love, that that love might flow out of us. That's the third Greek preposition, ipi, E-P-I, that he said to his disciples on, in, in uh, Acts 1.8, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, ippy. He will overflow you. First, I'm with you. You're convicted. You're saved. I'm in you because you're saved. I'm filling you up for the purpose of your subjective growth and development, but I'm going to f- overflow you. I'm not going to just fill you to the brim. The Spirit of God is going to overflow you that others might be touched by what's going on in your life. They'll see it for what it is. So he's going to overflow us. That's when the Spirit came on the day of Pentecost. And that passage in John was fulfilled because on that day, 3,000 people got saved. 3,000 people came under conviction. Jesus was there in spirit, convicting. And then they got saved. They were filled up. And they were baptized on that day. And they went out, and it says that day by day, people were being saved. Why? Because it's not just filling them up. It's overflowing into other people's lives. They can see something's different here with that guy. That guy used to cuss like a sailor. Now I never hear a negative word come out of his mouth. He's been changed. And I want what he's got, whatever that is. (laughs) That's God's calling to that man, drawing him as well. John chapter 14, verse 19. Look at verse 19. Write that one down. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live, you also will live. Again, Jesus is saying that I'm telling you, you are going to live just like I live after death. This is a promise from Jesus. When somebody dies who knows the Lord, here's what the scripture says about that. It says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saint. Paul said, to live is Christ, to die is, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. A person who knows the Lord, they are consciously aware whether they are awake or not. And then they take their last breath and they go from this state of consciousness into a whole new state of consciousness. They're not breathing in the next one because they're a spirit. But it's like if they took their next breath, they're with the Lord. And that's what Jesus just said, because I live, you also will live. How about John chapter 4? I'm just covering one chapter here, folks. There's five chapters of this stuff. He says in John 14, 25, these things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. By the way, you don't believe in Trinity because the word Trinity is not in the Bible. That's what people will say. And they're right. The word Trinity is not in the Bible. But what do you call this? Look what this is Jesus, God speaking. He says, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in in my name. He just covered all three. Jesus did. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. What is the work of the Holy Spirit? To teach you everything that's in this. Let me just say this, and I I want everybody to hear this. The Holy Spirit never functions on his own. There is no such thing as the Holy Spirit coming up with his own word for you. He only speaks what he receives from the Father. P. 
Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives, give I to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You talk about a promise? Now remember, put it in, put it in the context of what's happening. The next day he's going to be on the cross. He's gone. The disciples don't have him in the flesh anymore. He's giving all this to them so that, to prepare them. Because that's how much, that's why this is, this, all these chapters are about love. The love that the Father has for us. And that he wants us to express the same love to others. We haven't even got to the sermon yet. I don't know. I don't know. John 15, verse 18. Write it down. John 15, 18. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. We're going to cover that next week, too. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. That is a promise from Jesus. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. In other words, if they'll receive what I say, because what he is is the logos, right? He is the word. If they'll receive my word, then they'll also receive your word. Why? Not because you're speaking your own word that you think the Holy Spirit's given you that's separate from Jesus. The Holy Spirit would never do that. He would only confirm what Jesus is saying. He would only give you what Jesus is saying. You are actually speaking the Bible. You're speaking the truth. That's the word. And that they received it from Jesus, they'll receive it from you. That's awesome. John chapter 16, verse 13 through 15. Another promise. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. That's a promise. He will guide you into all truth. For he will, here it is, look at this. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will not speak on his own authority. Never has the Holy Spirit ever spoken on his own. If you ever go to a church service where the Holy Spirit does his own thing, and everybody's just seeking after the Spirit, not seeking the Bible, get out of there as fast as you can. Because nowhere in Scripture does it show the Holy Spirit acting on his own. He will only speak what he hears. That's what he will speak. Did you, let me read this again. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. So he'll guide you through the Bible. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. Well, what's he hearing? Only the Lord. That's right. The Father. The Son. Holy Spirit is the messenger. He's not up there doing his own thing. He's in full obedience to the Father. And the Father wants him to remind the people what Jesus said to them. That's the work of the Spirit. Look at verse 14. He, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me. He'll glorify Jesus. He will never glorify himself. That's not the work of the Holy Spirit. If somebody's trying to make it look like we need to glorify the Spirit, they're not in the Scripture. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So th these are just some of the wonderful statements and promises that God is giving to his disciples right before he goes to the cross. So many lessons that he's teaching. So chapter 13 through 17 are saturated with words that express how much God loves his own. And the remainder of John's gospel is a demonstration of that love hanging on a cross. First he expresses the love, and then he hangs on the cross to demonstrate the love that he has for the world. But this loving display hits its pinnacle right here. It hits its pinnacle right here. Verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. If you want to just put a summary on all these chapters that are all about God's love and how we should love God, the greatest picture of that is not you going to a cross and hanging there and dying. The greatest picture is you sacrificially loving one another. That is how they will know that you have passed from death to life by how you love 
the brethren. In these six verses that we're going to look at here, the Lord expresses the importance of loving one another. What Jesus essentially says over these five love chapters is the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Father, the Father and the Son love us, therefore we are to love God and we are to love one another. Love is at the center of our most important relationships on earth. Loving God, loving one another. As we look at our text, we're going to break it down. Three aspects. We're not going to get through it. Don't worry. I'm not going to cover all this. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm t- I got like three pages of notes just for the first point. I mean, I just so enjoy. Don't give me ten days off, okay? Because I just, I, I'm telling you, this was my devotional time. I'm speaking to you out of my devotional time, and oh, how how rich that is. Thank you, Lord. He'll always meet us if we truly are seeking him. He'll always meet us. You'll seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. David said, as the deer pants after the water brook, so my soul longs for thee, O God. And not to hear some kind of a weird thing, a new thing that comes from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will only give me what Jesus said. And what Jesus said in this right here is all I need to fire me up. So I think I'll just go for two more hours here. Let's go. Okay. You know I'm kidding. If I were in Jamaica, they, that wouldn't have bothered them one bit. They just started waving their little hankies. That's what they do when they hear the word. They, just, they wave the hanky at you. They, they, they love that. They don't come to church on time. Service starts at 10 a.m., they'll be there by 11. And they're bringing all their curds and whatever else to come in. But then after they're there, they ain't going nowhere for a while. They'll still stay till 2, 3 o'clock to fellowship, to live out what the Scripture teaches. Oh, how we have so much to learn from others. True? So in these six verses, the Lord expresses the importance of loving one another. What Jesus essentially says over these verses is you're going to love God and you're going to love one another. So he describes his disi- to, to his disciples, he describes them in three different ways, okay? First, he describes them as servants. Then he describes them as friends. And finally, he speaks of the fact that they have been chosen and appointed by him. Okay, so we're going to look at these three things. Write these down. These are the three points. I don't know. We might even have it on the screen. Christ submitted to the will. Write this down. Number one, Christ submitted to the will of the Father in order to demonstrate God's great love for us. Let me say it again. Christ submitted. That is not a popular word today in churches. Christ submitted to the will of the Father in order to demonstrate God's great love for us. Therefore, here it is. That's that's what Jesus did. Now, what about us? Therefore, as his, and the first description he gave was servant. As his servants, I am commanded to love his own. I am commanded to love those who are of the family of God. That's verse 12. Then verses 13 through 15, Christ demonstrated, number two, Christ demonstrated his love for us by reconciling us back to God through the work of the cross. Therefore, because Christ reconciled us back to God, he made us friends of God. We were at enmity with, with God before he died, right? But once Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. No longer do you have to go through a priest in order to offer sacrifice to God. Jesus became the once for all sacrifice. Now you have full access into the throne room of God. The scripture actually says where you can come in your time of need. Come boldly, it says, in your time of need. So in light of that, therefore... As his friends, 
We are compelled to love others sacrificially. First, I'm commanded to love God's people because I'm a servant and the master calls me to do it, commands me to do it, so I do it. But then, I'm his friend. He made me his friend. And that compels me to want to show the same sacrifice to others that Jesus showed to me. Then thirdly, because he chose and appointed me, I join him in his work by bearing the fruit of love. He's chosen me to be saved. And I'm so thankful for that, that I want to bear fruit for him. And the greatest fruit I can bear next to loving God and serving God is to serve my brothers and my sisters. So let's just look at one, a little bit of it. How are we doing on time? Thank you for not saying anything. It really doesn't matter. If you had said something, it wouldn't have mattered to me. Number one, verse 12. Number one, I am his servant, therefore I am commanded to love his own. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. First, notice the command. That's the first thing we need to see there. It's a command. This highlights the servant-lord relationship that he has with his disciples. And it is a servant-lord relationship. Jesus clearly stated in John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servants be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. God will honor the one who's willing to take the role of a servant with Jesus. That's encouraging. Do it. The Father honors. It pleases the Father when we are servants of Christ, when we submit to Jesus Christ. You cannot claim to be in relationship with Jesus if you reject the notion of serving him. Christianity is built upon this servant-lord relationship. There is no other relationship when you first come into the Lord. That's it. It's servant-lord. That means that we are in submission to his will and we obey what he commands. He commands that we love one another. John, write this down, John 13, 16. Truly, truly, when Jesus has to, to double up on words or triple up on a word, verily, verily, I say to you, that's what he's saying here. Truly, truly, that means he's, he's adding repetition for emphasis. He's saying, I really want you to get this. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Never is a messenger greater than the one who sent. Never is a servant greater than his master. The purpose of the relationship that I have with Christ is not that I get what I want from him. That's what is happening today. It's become all about wealth, health, prosperity, getting something from Jesus. That is not biblical. That's not what it's about. He's the master. I am the servant. We exist in Christ to do his will. Can I get an amen? It's not the other way around. We're not the greater in the relationship. He is. Our fruitful life is found in. In him. The reason you're bearing fruit is because of him. You're attached to the vine. You're abiding in Christ. That's why you bear fruit. You cannot bear fruit on your own. The Bible says, Jesus said in the story in the first part of this chapter, he said, if you're not bearing fruit, the Father comes along and he cuts you off and then he throws you on the pile and he burns you up. You got to bear fruit. You can't bear fruit if you're not in submission to Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. He is our life. Not our children. Our children are not our lives. I've got 13 grands and a 14th on the way, and men, I'll tell you, wow, how I love my grands. The Father says, 
that is not your greatest love in life. I must be your greatest love in life. And then next to that, I need you to love the brethren the way I love the brethren. Where does that fit in to your family? It should come ahead of your family. That you love people who love God. It doesn't mean you're not going to love your family. Of course you are. You're going to spend more time with your family than anybody else. That's just natural. That's right, okay? But don't let family crowd out the love that you have for God and the love that you have for his people. That's what he's saying. These are all benefits that God has graciously given us. Okay? He wants us to walk in them. Verse 12, this is my commandment that you love one another. Here's another thing, a second thing about that verse. Our Lord commands us to love one another. That sounds so bizarre. How do you command someone to love? I thought love was something only I choose. And I choose to, to give my lot love and I choose to receive love when it is right for me. We have a tendency to think that, that of love that, that as a choice, it's based on our feelings. I choose based on how I feel. But here our Lord is commanding us to love one another. And I want you to notice he doesn't take into consideration how we feel about it. Well, sorry about that. This, I just woke some of you up. That's good. This, this, this is really fascinating to me. Jesus is giving us a command to love one another, and he could care less what you feel like. Why? Why would he do that? How, I can't believe Jesus did that. He's your master. He can do whatever he wants. But there's no, hey, love one another when you feel like it. There's no love one another when people have proven they deserve your love. Or love one another when it benefits you. No, no. But we have to remember, this is not a human love based upon our what's best for me. This is a godly love based on what is best for God. And God says, what's best is that you obey me and you love one another. It doesn't sit too well with us, though, does it? The way we think about love. But this is love. We don't have a choice in it. Well, Pastor Reg, nobody's going to tell me when, when and who to love. That, that's like asking me to walk through a minefield. You're going to put me in a situation if I just love anybody, everybody, then I'm going to get wounded and hurt. And I'm going to tell you, yes, you will. If you love the way God's telling you to love, you will get wounded doing this. Don't you think God knows that? Well, why would he do that? To prune you so that you'll bear more fruit. It's through those moments of betrayal from another believer, through those moments of, of just frustration over what somebody has done to you, that you have an opportunity to come closer to God and grow in God so that you are a different person afterwards than you were when you went in. Uh, yesterday, I had an experience. I went into a grocery store locally just to pick up some coleslaw in a bag and a can of baked beans. You say, oh, Pastor Greg, that's a terrible meal. Uh, no, I purchased some really good fish. So we had a nice fish dinner. Uh, but I was in there just to get those two things, and I, and I got what I needed, and I turned, and I looked across in the produce, and there was somebody who was instrumental in a betrayal of me. And so as I saw them, I just kept turning, <laughs> and I got my two items, so I made a beeline for the, uh, uh, the ten, ten, ten items or less line. And I was in the line, a tap on my shoulder. Man, you walk fast. And I turned, and I called him by name, hey. And he said, uh, hey, you look good. And I said, well, thank you. I said, put on weight, so <laughs> I've got some work to do here. But, uh, but thank you, and you look good too. And just one minute of small talk, and I walked away. 
And I actually thought, I wish I could do that over again. I didn't express to him the love that I have for him. He is a child of God. He will be in heaven. He is my brother. I wanted to do over. And I got home and shared with Rini and I said, you know, it's like the Lord gave me a test today because he knew what I was preaching. And uh, by his providential hand, he had me run into somebody. And the good news is back after it happened, within a couple months, I had asked God to forgive me for holding him hostage. And I said, please, and forgive him for what he's done. I would never, I remember praying this, I would never want this to happen to him. And I meant it. I didn't mean it with my feelings, because I didn't feel it. But it's my will. I chose to forgive him. And yesterday was the test. And I felt like I passed the test. I didn't want to get angry. I didn't want to go back and, and hash out and bring up stuff and try to wound and hurt him at all. There was none of that in me. I truly had forgiven him six, five, six years ago. What I'm teaching you right now from the Word of God works. I know you don't want to do it as a command. You must if you're a believer. And it works. He commands you to forgive those who have hurt you. And that's part of God's providential plan for your life. See, he puts you in this church with people that are just as messed up as you are. And you are going to get in each other's way. And you are going to get offended. And you are going to say something that you wish you hadn't said. Or somebody else is just really ticked off by what you said. And you got to work through all of it. You don't leave the church family. You work through it. Because if you work through it, if you let God prune you through it, you are going to bear more fruit for him in the future. Amen? So here's what I'm saying. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that I want to be best buddies with this guy. Truth is, I don't trust him. So I'm not looking for a close relationship. But I am forgiving him. And I did, it's already happened. I forgave him. I must forgive him. It's commanded by Christ that I forgive him. Why? What has Christ done for me? <laughs> I'm the one that put him on the cross. I was at enmity with God. I was the one nailing the nails into his hands. I wonder if Jesus felt like it when he's hanging from two nails in his hands. But that was the greatest act of his love towards us. It has nothing to do with feelings. It has everything to do with obedience. Master, servant. That's who we are. We're not even going to cover the... <laughs> there's other points I want to make on this first point, and we're not even through those. I feel like I sense that maybe we've said enough. There's enough here for us to go off and have time with the Lord in his word and just meditate on John 15, verse 12 and 13. We'll come back and pick up next week in verse 13. And we'll just shorten our time on uh, the relationship with the world. We'll cover some of that too, hopefully. So I, I want to do something here uh, in closing in light of this passage, and this is hard stuff, really hard stuff. And I know some of you struggle to forgive. You've told me. And I'm, it sounds harsh for me to say, but you have to do it. But really, it's an act of love. If I don't tell you you must do it, then I don't really love you. I know, I know personally the beautiful blessing that comes when I obey Christ and I submit and I forgive. And I want you to have that too. So if you're here today and you do not know the Lord, oh, you know who he is, you know all that, but you've never come under his headship, 
you've never been saved. You've never been born again where the Holy Spirit comes in and fills you up. And when he fills you up subjectively, you know the difference. If you don't see a difference in who you are today from what you were before you came to Christ, before you were called by God, you're not saved. There's a difference. And if you've not experienced that, I want you to come forward at the close. I'd like to talk to you about the gospel and give you a full understanding of the gospel because obviously the fact that you came is God calling you. You want to respond to the call of God. And then for the rest of us, I want us to just receive this this morning. Stand up if you will. Paul prayed a beautiful prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. And I want to pick it up around verse 16. And this is, this is a blessing that I sense I should give you today. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints. Don't leave anybody out. What is the breadth and the length and the height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Boy, I want that for you. I can't imagine how much the Lord wants it for you. I can't fathom that. But we know from Scripture He does. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power of work with, at, at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Father, thank you for this time in your word. Nothing on this earth can line us up with you like the word of God. May we receive your word and may we come into greater understanding of ourselves and we, may we submit to you in this area of loving one another, forgiving those who have hurt us and harmed us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.